is to both restore and renew. Um, we'll be looking at different passages about building and different passages on uh, res renewing and restarting and restoring. And today we want to look at an interesting passage in Joel chapter 2. Uh, and it's about restoring the lost years, or restoring what the locust has eaten. Um, and uh, and you'll all know those years. Those years where you really just, you could have been and should have been doing more for God, but you kind of just floated along. And you get to a stage in life where you realize you've, you've really lost all this time because money can be restored, property can be restored, broken cars can be restored, old paintings can be restored, relationships can be restored, but there's one thing that can never be restored, and that's time. You never get to go back and have a do-over when it comes to time. And uh, one, of the, one of the saddest experiences I had of this was uh, when we were in Palabora, we, we ran out of the school, and there was, uh, was one of the young boys, the most delightful young man. Um, and he really loved his dad. His dad was in the Special Forces, and uh, he was so proud of his dad, and he really just got on so well with his dad. And then his dad got this brilliant idea. I'm going to go over to Dubai to make some money, and then I'll come back. Just for one year, he said to the family. So he left the wife and the son who was just starting high school and he said, just for one year I'm going to go and make lots of money and then come back. And he went over for his year and at the end of the year he said, honey, I'm making so much money. One more year and I'll come back. And so the one year turned into two years, turned into three years, turned into four years. And eventually this young man was in matric. And he was a destroyed young man, had no purpose, didn't know what to do with himself, it was just discipline problems at school. And you think, here is this kid who's getting everything, I mean the latest in iPhones, the latest in computers, the latest in everything, but no dad. And the dad came back eventually towards the end of high school and he made this comment, I've wasted my whole son's high school, I wasn't here thinking that I could go and get all this and everything they wanted, but at the end of the day, he needed a dad. And he could never get those high school years back again. And so often we find ourselves in these similar situations where we kind of look and we think, well, I've really wasted all this time. Especially people who get saved later on in life and think, man, if only I'd come to know Jesus as a young man, I could have done so much more for God. And when we went over to, uh, to the Palabora to see my uh, family from my dad's memorial service, I realized too, for the first so many years of my dad's life, he was not saved. Wasted years. And then he met Jesus. And we were born. And for the next 40 years, I said, I'm like, I can hear myself. Is that too much? Okay, let's go to the other one. Otherwise, we can have wasted years here on this microphone. <laughs> And so for the, next, for the next 40 years, my dad was saved, he was loving God, he was doing hospital ministries, he was involved in all sorts of various church things, and then dad moved to the UK. And for the next 20 years, nothing. No church, no church family, no church ministry. And you think, 40 years wasted, 40 years on fire for God, and then 20 years wasted. And this morning, Israel finds themselves in a similar situation where they get to an end of four years of just drought, four years of just being punished, disciplined by God. They've lost everything. And God comes to them and says, You know what, Israel? Because of my love for you, I'm going to restore those wasted years. And so, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Joel chapter 2. Uh, we're going to read the promise. We're going to look at uh, conditions to get that promise, but it's a beautiful, beautiful promise. And this is just after he's spoken about the day of the Lord and uh, why they are in this place. And for four years, they farmed, they've sowed, they've planted, and they've had nothing, no returns. And then in Joel chapter 2, we have this beautiful, beautiful promise. Starts in verse 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. 
the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land. With his face toward the eastern sea and his back towards the western sea, his stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for your open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors will be full of wheat, and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil, and then we get this beautiful promise. And so, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Yes, God promises the impossible. He says, I will restore the earth, the years that the locust has eaten. The immediate meaning of the promise is clear. God's people had suffered a complete destruction of the entire harvest through swarms of locusts. And the Bible says that the locusts came in like soldiers, like marching troops, destroying the crops, multiplying in numbers as they went. For four consecutive years, the harvest was completely wiped out. God's people were brought to their knees in more ways than just one. But the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. Isn't that amazing? Even when we've had these wasted years, God has pity. God looks down on us and says, man, I've got such big dreams for these people. Behold, I am sending you grain and wine and oil and you will be Satisfying. What God is saying, He's saying, I can't give you back those four years, but all the crop that you should have had in those four years, I'm going to give you one abundant harvest. And so it would be as if you had harvested those four years. This is what God is saying. God is saying, We can't give you back those wasted years, but I'm going to make you so fruitful in this time now that it's going to make up for all the years you wasted. And that's what we want to say to God. If you say, God, I don't want to waste any more time. I don't want to waste years doing things that I know you've called me to do. I want to be so fruitful that it makes up for those years I wasted. That's what God wants to give us this morning, this beautiful promise of restoring what we've wasted, those lost years. You see, these lost years in our lives, they're, uh, they're fruitless years. When you see these scriptures, you find that these guys were farming, and they were working hard. They were serving, and they were doing everything right. But they had nothing to show for it. And sometimes when you realize, when you get to these stages, and you look back and you realize, I've worked hard for these last five years, but I've really added nothing to God's kingdom. I've really, I've really just worked hard, and I've filled my hours, and I've filled my day, but I haven't really done anything for God. Wasted years, fruitless years. All this work that's been done and I've got nothing to show for it. Some of you will know that pain in business when you, you, you invest and you work hard and then the business fails. It's just all those years that you're so into it, gone. That's the feeling of these lost years. They're fruitless years. These lost years are sometimes painful years. When you think of, of losing loved ones and you have all these plans, all these things you're going to do, and, <laughs> and then things change. 
Can you imagine all those families in Germany had all these plans of what they're going to do? All of that's gone. Those are sometimes painful years. These last years are sometimes very selfish years. When you get to say you realize that you've done all these things and you've made a commitment to Christ, but it hasn't really been a deep relationship. Faith in Jesus was, was not really a big part of your life. When you look and you realize that everything you've done in the last few years has been very selfish. It's been about me and what I want and what I want to get out. And then you get to this stage where you realize and you ask yourself this question, what in the world have I been doing? There's no substance in my life. I really wanted to count for Christ. I want to live in the power of the Spirit. I want to make a difference in the world. Not only are these lost years selfish and painful, but they're, they're loveless years. You chat to people who have been in relationships where they've just since over years the love has grown cold and you think to yourself, why am I still here? Why am I still in this relationship? It's just, I'm just, what's the point? Children growing up, these years can never be recovered. Marriages that are quietly just enduring, plodding on, lost years of love. These lost years are also sometimes very rebellious years. Perhaps you grew up with, with many blessings, but in your heart you wanted to rebel. Front and arms and says, well, I'm going to first just go and experience life, and then I'll come back to God. Wasted years. Many times our wasted years are because we just misdirected. We kind of choose a path, and we've just been plotting in this for many years, and then you get to say, you kind of ask yourself, why am I doing this? I don't even enjoy this. I'm an accountant or a bookkeeper, but I, I don't enjoy what I do. And then you think, well, for 20 years I've been doing this and I don't even enjoy what I'm doing. Wasted years. But lost years are also Christless years. All Christless years are these locust years. This point is worth thinking about if you've never made that commitment to Christ. You think, for so many years I've been religious, or for so many years I've been in church, but I've never really committed to Christ. Lost years. And God is looking to this nation of Israel and saying, guys, for four years, you've done nothing. But it's time to change. It's time to change. God wants to restore those lost years. God can restore lost years and bring us into a better relationship with God. A relationship that is deeper than it's ever been before. A relationship where we're just once again on fire for God. That's our heart. We're saying, God, we want to have a deep communion with you. Verse 27 of chapter 2 says, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord. That was God's heart of why He wanted to bless them again. He wanted them to be so blessed that they would once again recognize we're in a bright place with God again. That's what we want to ask for. We say, Lord, I've spent too many years without You, too many years distant from You. I want You to fill my heart with love and gratitude for Christ. And let's make those lost years count by making these next few years the greatest that I've ever had in my relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, God can restore these lost years by multiplying your fruitfulness. The harvest that the people had been wiped out for four years, God restored those years that the locusts had eaten by giving them a bumper harvest. Do you think of the passage in uh, Matthew where he talks about the, the 30-fold, the 60-fold, or even a 100-fold? But you know that 10 years of 30-fold is the same as 3 years of 100-fold. You can say, God, over the next 10 years, I want to be just a little bit more. Or you can say, God, for the next 3 years, I want to be so fruitful. 100-fold. That's what I want. Lord, give me back that wasted years. God can restore lost years by bringing long-term grain from the short-term loss. The effect of these great trials in your life will be so that the genius of your faith 
can result in praise and glory and honor. In the week I was looking at the primary school we did ministry, came across the passage in 1 Peter, a beautiful passage, 1 Peter chapter 1. I just want to turn in. Keep one finger, Joel. Peter writing to the church who had been scattered, who had, uh, had lost focus, had lost purpose. They were uh, sitting in, in different parts of Asia and Cappadocia and Galatia, and they were kind of questioning God, what's the point? We've worked so hard and everything just falling apart. And all these questions. So Peter writes to them, to these scattered pilgrims. 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to just read verse 3 down to verse 4. Beautiful. Verse, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has forgotten us again, been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, there is an inheritance waiting for you, but don't wait for that. Get fruitful now. And even know that these trials that you go through, these wasted years, in a sense, were preparing your faith so that your faith would be stronger. So that at the end of the day, God will get the praise, the glory, and the honor. Notice that this restoring of the years is not because of anything I can do. I can't restore my lost years. But listen to the promise that God gives here. God says, I will restore to you what the locust has eaten. You can't get these years back. Nobody can give them back to you. But God says, I will restore them to you. Can you believe God for that? Can you trust God for that? Say, God, you are able to make my next years the most fruitful they've ever been because you are the one. God is the one who does the restoring. You will restore. But you notice there's a catch here. And it goes back to verse 12 of chapter 2. God will restore, but there is something we need to do. Chapter 2, verse 12. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. He says, you need to get to the place where you recognize the lost years. And then you say, God, I'm sorry. I've wasted so many opportunities. I've wasted so much time. Wasted so much. But I repent. And I want to make right. And I want to move forward. Repent. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and let the bride come out from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep before the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not grieve, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, 
Where is their God? He says, when there's repentance, then God does an amazing work. I mean, that was the first cry even in the wilderness of John the Baptist. Repent. Come back to God. Seek God again. Turn from your evil ways. Turn back to God. And God will restore what the locust has stolen. I want to show you a practical application of how this works in the book of Acts. And there's an amazing story there in Acts of someone who wasted so many years, but God restored and renewed and gave him back those wasted years. And it's in Acts chapter 7, and that's where Stephen is giving a bit of a history lesson. But I love the way he includes the story of Moses in this. And there's some, some valuable truths in this little passage of scripture here. Acts chapter 7. And we're going to pick up verse 20. At this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians and in the mighty words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. So here he's 40 years old and he says like, God, you've got a plan for me. My plan is to help my people. And so he goes out and he does it in his own strength. And he intervenes and he kills an Egyptian and says, now surely the people are going to love me and celebrate me and say, Moses, lead us out. Boy, did he have a bad awakening the next morning. The next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them saying, men, you are brethren. Why are you doing this to one another? But when he who did this to his neighbor pushed him away saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? At this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. Who made you ruler and leader over us? <laughs> Those words must have hurt Moses. Here he says, God, you've raised me up to deliver the people. Here we are, people. They say, no, thank you. We don't want you here. Go for us. This is the deliverer. The one who God's spirit is in me. The one who God has trained and equipped and prepared for 40 years. And listen to verse 38. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a fiery fire, a flame of fire. For 40 years, Moses spent time in the desert wandering around aimlessly, purposely. That's half of his life. Here he is, an 80 year old man, saying, For 40 years, I've wasted time. Instead of delivering the people like God had called me to do, I've spent 40 years wasting away. Until he sees the burning bush and God says to him, Moses, listen to this. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight and he drew near to observe it. And the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. And the Lord said to him, Take the sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. God doesn't say to him, Moses, you wasted 40 years. Moses says, God says to Moses, Moses, I am God. Moses and God have an encounter. And he says, all right, let's go and do what we should have done 40 years ago. Let's go and set those people free. And for the next 40 years, 
after they come out of Egypt, he just sees signs and miracles and wonders and manner and all these amazing things. In the last 40 years of Moses' life, he makes up for the 40 years he wasted in the wilderness. But listen to verse 35. This Moses, whom they rejected, who made you ruler and judge, is the one God sent to be ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He says, Moses, you were called to be a ruler, not a ship in the desert. It's time to rule again. Get to those people that be their ruler. And this is what God is telling us, church, He hasn't called us to spend 40 years as a sitter on a chair. He hasn't called you for city for, for, for the next year or two. He's called you to rule and reign. He's called you to be a warrior. He's called you to fight. He's called you to stand up. Then it's time to stop wasting years. And let's make up for what we've wasted. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this promising job that you will restore. You will restore the years that the locusts have stolen. Father, we've, we've wasted opportunities, we've wasted time, we've wasted sometimes years not being fruitful for you. We repent of that this morning. We say, Lord, enough is enough. For too long the locusts have stolen, for too long the locusts have distracted us. It's time for us to allow God to restore the fruitfulness in our lives. It's time for us to begin to fight the good fight. It's time for us to take back ground that the enemy has stolen from us. Father, it's time for us to stand. And so we ask, forgive us for those wasted years and restore. Restore what the enemy and the locust has eaten. Make our next months, weeks, days the most fruitful that we've ever seen. We surrender to you, Lord. We say, Lord, it's time for us to leave the desert. It's time for us to rule, because that's what you call us to do. Help us to take that place. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Worship you.